Most of all, I want to welcome Max Haven, who is coming in today to speak on the great new book. I encourage everyone to get it and read it well. And, and Max has just agreed to do a follow-up event the tying in the chapter on the opioid crisis that is in the book. But I'm going to let Max carry the show from this point forward. Later on, with questions and comments, please write the word stack in chat or raise your hand in, in your rectangle there on Zoom. And Max, take it away. Sure, thanks. Um, I'm going to share this presentation here. Michael, could you let me share my screen under the security? I think it would be under the security or an under screen sharing. Oh, I'm a co-host now. All right. Can you see that? Super. Um, so yeah, thanks so much uh, for inviting me and thank you all for coming um, to this talk. What I thought I would do is kind of give you a bit of a tour of the book. Um, it's a book I worked on for many years um, and has a lot of different parts to it. And so hopefully at least some of the parts will be interesting. But I thought I'd begin by, uh, yeah, going through sort of the chapters and, and what's in the book. And then what I would do is I, at the end of the book, there's a coda where I try and summarize the arguments of the book in sort of 11 theses. Um, and I'll share those with you. And then to close this presentation, which hopefully will be about half an hour, um, I thought maybe we could close and open up a discussion around the recent events uh, with the Rittenhouse trial and how that might connect to themes of revenge and revenge capitalism. Um, so this book has a number of different origins, but largely they have to do with me grappling with, um, you know, as a scholar and an activist grappling with the incredible monumental crimes and horrors being unleashed by the capitalist system um, and feeling as any of us necessarily feel, anyone who cares about other people in the fate of the planet, just a seething sense of rage a huge amount of the time. Um, I'm generally a fairly happy and optimistic person, but that doesn't prevent me and I'm sure most of you from feeling like, desiring revenge. Um, you know, I was just looking yesterday at statistics around what happened over the roughly 80 years in which the um, tobacco industry waged its war on people's health. Exactly zero people were ever convicted or sent to jail for basically lying to the public for eight decades about the cancer causing chemicals in cigarettes. Uh, millions and millions of people died. All of us, I presume, in this room, the Zoom room, know somebody who died from that. And yet, no one paid the price for that. Uh, we were just talking about the opioids uh, epidemic, which is so far, by some estimates, killed a million people in the United States. A million people over the last 15 years. That's an incredible number of people. Uh, and yet the company that, I mean, the company went bankrupt because they were basically uh, lawsuited to death and the federal government and the states uh, stepped in to basically create a kind of weird shell company for it. But the people who benefited from that, the people who made the major decisions, you know, for the vast majority of them, they're never going to face any consequences. The uh, people who run the uh, fossil fuel corporations who like the pharmaceutical industry and the tobacco industry actively knew the horrifying consequences of climate change that was being created by their products. None of them are ever going to go to trial. Um, and if those facts alone aren't enough to make us seethe with a desire for revenge, I don't know what would. Um, that said, of course, revenge is a very dangerous um, topic. It's a very dangerous part of the human psyche. Um, and so in this book, I wanted to kind of dwell with it from three angles. The first is I'm curious about the role of revenge in culture. I'm actually trained as a literary and cultural theorist. So I'm always thinking through culture. And I was thinking about the rise of revenge as a genre in the last 20 or so years, of sort of, you know, uh, fatally uh, death spiral neoliberal capitalism. I was thinking about the popularity of Game of Thrones 
or the popularity of Quentin Tarantino's films. And then, of course, the, the book uh, began to take its, its form that it reached when it was published in 2020, uh, several years before that, um, with the rise, again, of the fascistic right um, and the kind of revenge politics that seemed to be on the um, stalking the sort of global scene. Um, and so I wanted to explore the rise of that kind of revenge politics when, you know, at a certain point in neoliberal capitalist, uh, the neoliberal capitalist world, people seem to give up on the idea that their political ideology is going to strive for a better world and simply trade that for a kind of desire for revenge, for politicized revenge. But then the kind of third part of the book was to say that, well, you know, there's plenty of liberal commentators now who are writing about an age of anger or an age of resentment, et cetera, et cetera. All of these kind of proxies that uh, stand in for the sort of liberal fear of this thing that they call the extremes. Um, but I wanted to tie this rise of revenge politics to what I think of as a revenge economy. And here I'm thinking about the way that global racial capitalism appears, I mean, if you were to, if you were to be, stand on Mars and squint at planet Earth, you might be tempted to say that it seemed like a system that humans had created called global racial capitalism was taking a needless, warrantless revenge on the very people who created it. That revenge, of course, uh, is taking form of pressingly climate change, but also taking the form of these incredible forms of cruelty that seem to... Uh, even go beyond the crassest necessity of capital. So I'm thinking here of the ways in which whole populations are left to starve and die as they try and migrate uh, across the world, as humans have always done. I'm thinking about the prison industrial complex in the United States, but also elsewhere, which essentially churns through the lives of working class, black and racialized people with such incredible hunger. I'm thinking about all of the ways that the global economy simply abandons people to a terrible fate when that actually is not strictly necessary. And so in this book, I follow a kind of Marxist paradigm to suggest that while, of course, there are individuals who are responsible for all of these evils, in a weird way and in a way that I think we need to attend to as people trying to bring down capitalism, all of those individuals are completely replaceable. I mean, if you put on the stand of the People's Tribunal, anyone from the Purdue Pharma or the other opioid manufacturers or the tobacco companies or the um, uh, fossil fuel companies, they would all say pretty much the same thing, which is, uh, you know, the old Nazi defense. If I didn't do it, someone else would have done it. Uh, there was nothing else I could do. And, and adding to that kind of uh, typical... Uh, I was just doing my job. I couldn't have done anything else under the circumstances. You would also have a perhaps slightly more sophisticated argument, which is the market made me do it, right? If we, uh, you know, Philip Morris had not sold cigarettes to teenagers, then our competitor would have done it. If we, Purdue Pharma, hadn't sold opioids to people uh, and told them it was safe, then our competitor would have done it. If we, Exxon, had not, uh, you know, sold fossil fuels as a safe uh, you know, with a safe way to engage in the, with, in the planetary ecosystem, our competitors would have done it. So, so, so to a certain extent, these forms of vengeance that I'm trying to think through are pushed and activated by the market. So there are people who enacted those choices, but something about the system itself needs to be unpacked and understood. So I'll give you a brief tour of the book. The introduction makes the argument that I've essentially just outlined to you and also outlines the rest of the book. In the first substantial chapter of the book, I go through what I try and uncover this kind of um, Marxist, secret Marxist theory of revenge. And of course, many, many Marxist thinkers have thought and talked about revenge, including Marx himself and Engels. Uh, the desire for revenge was very strong among the proletariat in Western Europe where they were organizing and thinking. Uh, I go through a sort of canon of uh, anti-colonial thinkers, including um, Franz Fanon and C.L.R. James, who both had very interesting things to say about revenge. And slowly I try and uncover a kind of secret history of revenge. And very briefly, that secret history essentially revolves around a way that throughout capitalist history, 
those with power, the oppressors, have sought to label the oppressed as pathologically uh, and animalistically vengeful. And in the name of controlling and containing the vengeance of the oppressed, which the oppressor dreams about, the oppressor then licenses themselves to undertake preemptive or preventive vengeance. So essentially, the history of capitalism is not only those forms of revenge of, for instance, when the Pinkertons murder a bunch of union organizers, or when colonial troops murder a bunch of striking uh, workers or, or a slave uprising. Those are the sort of the, 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 the specific acts of revenge. There's also this broader systemic and structural forms of revenge that begin to emerge as well from the system as it endures and enters into crises. And I toy with the idea that maybe calling it revenge rather than simply calling it the violent contradictions of capitalism opens up something a little bit different for us in our thinking about what capitalism is, how it's changing, and what is occurring in the political economy more broadly. This is the theme that I explore in the other chapters of the book. And in between most of the chapters, there are little interludes that I go through where I try and engage with works of culture, some of them very historic and some of them very contemporary, which I think shed or, or cast an interesting light on this conundrum that I'm working through. So in the first such section that comes between chapters one or two, I talk about The Merchant of Venice, uh, which is, of course, an incredible play by Shakespeare, an incredible anti-Semitic play, but which does very fascinating things. So Merchant of Venice is, of course, a comedy, if told from the perspective of the bullies and oppressors, of Antonio, the colonial merchant and investor, and his, his pals. When told from the perspective of Shylock and the Jews of Venice, it is a tragedy, and a horrifying tragedy at that. Um, because, you know, in most tragedies, the villain or the, the hero at least gets to die at the end, whereas at the end of Merchant of Venice, Shylock has to live on in a state of perpetual humiliation. Um, in that chapter, I, I pose this question of how something that looks like a comedy from one angle can look like a tragedy from another angle. And from the perspective of the oppressor, the pathological racialized vengefulness of Shylock appears as a kind of monstrous specter. But in fact, what that monstrousness hides is the fact that Shylock and other, the other Jews of Venice in this, in this narrative have been um, oppressed by a system of racial injustice that is itself vindictive. So the original vengeance against the Jews of Venice is hidden as then the vengefulness of that system is displaced onto the very people it's oppressing. In the second chapter, I continue continue some work I'd done in a previous book called Art After Money, Money After Art, um, by looking at artworks and the way that um, art can reveal things that we can't necessarily speak about in other terms. And in this chapter, I think about unpayable debt. And I think about unpayable debt in two ways. In the first place, I argue that our world today, 40 years after the neoliberal revolution, is basically suffused with unpayable debts. These are unpayable debts from above, as I call them. And these are the debts that, for instance, most students today are forced to undertake in order to study, to gain the skills they need to compete in the capitalist economy. It takes the form of the unpayable debt of many countries in the global south who, emerging from colonization, were forced to borrow from their, fellow, fellow, or their, their former colonizers as a means to try and enter the race, uh, the sort of rat race of the global economy. But these debts, of course, over the last 50, 60 years have proven themselves to be unpayable, a pattern that recurred, for instance, recently in Puerto Rico uh, and other jurisdictions as well, as a kind of unpayable debt was forced onto the population. Greece as well is a fine example. Um, and then, of course, we have the unpayable debts um, that, for instance, take the form of carbon emissions, where we are essentially putting the Earth's ecosystems into an unpayable debt, where, you know, that, those, those, that carbon is going to cascade into massive catastrophic impacts, a kind of debt that we can never pay down, ultimately, because of the way that um, the global uh, climactic systems work. So in this chapter, I look at that, and I look at several artworks that seek to try and understand those unpayable debts. But then underneath that, I'm also wondering about unpayable debts from below. And these are the debts that the oppressed ought to be able to claim from the oppressor, 
But of course, within the power structures of global racial capitalism, they can never do so. So these are the debts, of, for instance, that should be paid in, for, in the form of reparations, the debt that should be paid in terms of the repatriation of stolen indigenous land, Repa uh, sorry, reparations for slavery, I should be specific, or reparations for colonialism. These are the debts that are owed to the, all those generations, those future generations yet to come, who will endure the climactic and environmental catastrophe that previous generations of capitalist uh, enterprises have unleashed on them. So in this chapter, I look at the way in which art tries to contend with these unspeakable debts, these debts that are somehow hidden in plain sight, that everyone acknowledges on some level are unpayable, and yet may still have some sort of either force, uh, sort of an oppressive force, or a force that might give us tools for rethinking liberation. That's followed by a chapter on Moby Dick, which I won't go into except to say that it's very much inspired by C.L.R. James's amazing book on Melville and uh, Moby Dick, which he wrote while uh, imprisoned on Ellis Island, awaiting deportation as you know a, a communist agitator. Um, a fascinating book, Mo Moby Dick, but in any room, only 5% of the people are actually interested in talking about Moby Dick and we bore the other 95% of everyone there. So if you're that 5%, let's stick around after and we can talk about how amazing that book is. Most people don't think so. Um, the third chapter is about money as a medium of vengeance. Uh, and here I, I do some work that I think has late, more recently been done by David McNally very, very well to show that money has encrypted within it the kind of violence of capital and can be also a kind of means to decrypt uh, capitalism through a kind of investigation of money and how money works in its histories. But what I do a bit differently in this chapter is I look at these kind of strange stories of what I call proletarian money sabotage, where proletarians and oppressed people started using money in ways they weren't supposed to be using it, using it as a medium of communication by carving messages into it, using it as a platform for the radical imagination by making new forms of money. Um, a really fascinating sort of hidden archive of uh, resistance to the way that money becomes a medium of, um, of, of vengeance. After that, I talk about a very stupid show called Khloe Kardashian's Revenge Body, uh, which is a reality TV show in which the eponymous uh, celebrity helps people lose weight or gain weight. Um, it's horrifically problematic and all, for all sorts of reasons, but very popular. And I compare that to the ways in which the Zapatistas have been thinking about the body, because the revenge body is a kind of obsessive consumerist approach and highly patriarchal approach to body and what bodies mean and the politics of the body. The chapter, which perhaps we'll talk about at a future event, so I won't speak about it uh, at length here, is on the opio opioid crisis. And it was spurred by the interesting t statistic, which has since been called into question, but is still worth thinking about, which is that one of the single greatest predictors statistically of if a county in the United States would shift its vote from voting um, for Barack Obama in 20, 2012 to Donald Trump in 2016 was the rate of so-called deaths from despair largely driven by the vast increase in overdose deaths. So there's something very interesting for me here to think about not only how the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma and these other companies went, got off scot-free and never had to answer for their incredible crimes of poisoning the whole population uh, through the opioid crisis, there's also something interesting to me about thinking through social pain and how social pain uh, becomes a resource for certain kinds of revenge and revenge fantasies as well. But we'll speak about that at a future event, I hope. There's a um, chapter about Joker and comparing the kind, of, the kind of politics represented in the recent film Joker with the politics from about 10 years earlier from the film V for Vendetta, which some of you might remember, uh, which popularized the Guy Fawkes mask, which has now become a staple at protests across the political spectrum around the world. Uh, interestingly enough, and I meditate in that chapter on the nature of masks and the ways in which protests uh, can espouse or evoke kind of desire or dream of political revenge. There's a chapter on dead zones, which I won't go into here. Um, and then in the conclusion, I try and make a distinction between 
revenge fantasy and an avenging imaginary. And I'll come back to this in a moment here. Um, I was able to also write a short prose script uh, just as the pandemic was beginning, which was when the book was published. Um, which going back over it, I think I got some things right and some things I did not get right. I thought the pandemic would take a lot less time to see its way through for, for certain. And there's many things that I, of course, couldn't and didn't anticipate. Uh, but it's an interesting historical um, mark. The image on the left here is from a graphic novel I created with a wonderful uh, radical left comic collective from Ottawa called Ad Astra. Um, and we worked together to transform the opioids chapter into a, graph, a short graphic novel, which you can find at uh, the website empiresofpain.com, I think. Uh, but we can talk about that more at a future session, if you like. So with the time remaining, I'd like to go through the kind of theses that animate the book that I kind of distilled after writing it. And there are 11 of them because, of course, every Marxist book has to have 11 theses. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe go through them and describe them briefly, but I don't want to take up too much time because I want to make sure that we have uh, sufficient time for a, a good conversation. So the first, uh, the first is this formulation that the desire for revenge stems from the reckless determination that what you love has value in a world where it has been rendered worthless. I wanted to begin here with two key terms, and one of them is value, because I wanted to write a Marxist book about revenge, so ultimately it has to do with value and a theory of value. And what I came to here is that, of course, as we know, capitalism as a system constantly devalues things that we should be valuing from our lives, our time, the natural world, the so-called natural world around us, uh, human solidarity, human creativity. All of these things are fundamentally devalued and transformed into commodities under capitalism through the kind of relentless logic of, um, of commodification and, and the capitalist value form. So, what happens to us when those things that we love are transmuted and transformed into something for capital's exploitation or use? And the second thing here is to begin a book on re revenge by talking about love. One of the interesting things I found while researching revenge is that it's very rare for people to take revenge for themselves or for things that have been done to them. It's much more common for people to take revenge on behalf of another person that they love or on behalf of a principle that they love. I think that's significant and worth dwelling with and to think through whatever both positive and negative elements there are to a politics of revenge, coming at it through what happens when something you love is devalued, whether that's a forest, whether that's a person, whether that's a group of people. Uh, whether, you know, in, in more reactionary valences, that might be a nation or it might be a religion. Uh, but beginning with this sense of love and affronted love, I think, is very significant and worthwhile. The second thesis is that when you live in somebody else's utopia, all you have left is revenge. Now, that's not necessarily because um, that's the only political tool at your disposal, but that's part of it. By definition, if you live in somebody else's utopia, that utopia is supposed to include all of the political tools you would need to transform society. But if it's not your utopia, if you're a slave in that utopia or a worker who's building that utopia, or you've been included in that utopia by mistake, or that utopia doesn't have a space to include you based on your religion, based on your uh, gender expression, based on your sexuality, then you're trapped in somebody else's utopia. In that sense, you may need to undertake tactics that the utopians around you will think are revenge and can only understand as revenge. But more than that, regardless of what you do, even if you ask in the most polite ways, if it doesn't fit within the utopian schema under which you're operating, it will nonetheless be interpreted as revenge by the utopians, because from the utopian point of view, they live in a perfect system. Now, I don't think anyone on earth thinks we live in a perfect system. But I've argued here and elsewhere that in a strange way, we do live in capital's utopia. 
if capital were a person and capital could design its utopia, it would look a lot like the world we live in now. Because essentially what we have is a system that relentlessly and very successfully transmutes almost any social and economic process on planet Earth into a kind of code that can then be interoperable with the kind of logics of speculative capital. So essentially, capital now moves around the globe with incredible alacrity and ease. It has certainly enriched a very small number of people who probably live lives that are quite utopian, although statistics seem to indicate they're still very unhappy for all of that. But I'm not so concerned with the lives of the vastly rich. I'm more concerned with the system itself and what would happen if we attributed to the system certain kinds of human motivation not because I think that that's particularly analytically useful, because of course to say that the capitalist system is vindictive or to say that the capitalist system is utopian doesn't actually explain that much about its underlying fundamental mechanics. But it is critically useful. It does bring us to ask new and interesting questions about the entanglements, not only of economics, but also in economics and politics, economics and culture, economics and subjectivity. And those are the things that I'm most interested in. The third thesis is that oppression is held in place by the preemptive revenge of the powerful, which is justified as a precaution against the fantasized vengeance of the oppressed. Here in the book, I go into a long history of colonial officials, slaveholders, bosses, uh, and other oppressors, and the way they've thought and written about those whom they're oppressing. And one of the things that becomes uh, quite clear consistently, especially in an age of capitalist liberalism, is that these oppressors are able to draw on sort of modern uh, liberal philosophers to argue that the people that they're oppressing are fundamentally subhuman and bestially vengeful. And that it may be regrettable that they need to be oppressed and exploited, but this is for everyone's good because to leave it up to them would see society descend into the chaos of vindictive revenge. There's a kind of teleological argument in Western political thought that suggests that in its earliest stages, human society was nothing but revenge. And slowly the institution of the state and later the institutions of capital arose to prevent humans from falling back into this brutal state of nature. But as David Graeber and David Rengro have argued very beautifully in their recently published book, and sadly, David Graeber was not, did not live to see its publication. This is, of course, a completely bogus uh, claim. But it does do a certain kind of work, because if you fundamentally believe that the people you're oppressing or exploiting are subhumanly vengeful, then it justifies almost any means to preserve society, preserve civilization through their continued oppression and exploitation. Capitalism this is the fourth thesis, has sort of claimed to banish revenge to its borderlands. You know, there's a very interesting, but obviously very deeply problematic set of theories around the so-called capitalist peace from uh, the kind of right side of political science. Uh, This is cited quite uh, with quite a bit of praise by Steven Pinker in his best-selling book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. The argument here is that capitalism represents the kind of culmination of the Enlightenment, the culmination of modernity, and therefore has banished revenge, the politics of revenge, to the borderlands. That's just something that happens in failed states, in the prison, in gangland. It's not something that happens at the core of capitalism. The argument of this book is that actually revenge has in some ways moved to the core of capitalism's operations, and we see that most clearly and cleanly in moments of crisis when that system, again, seeks to take this needless, warrantless, relentless revenge on people who frankly just don't deserve it. The fifth thesis is that whereas all systems of oppression take vengeance against those whom they oppress, capitalism is unique in that the vengeance emerges from the contradictions of the system itself without any necessary malice or hatred. Revenge under capitalism is the outcome of the system, not the motive of the system. When I often give talks on revenge capitalism, people get very hung up on saying, well, If nobody intends revenge, can it actually be called revenge? And my answer in this book is yes. Revenge is the outcome. It is a system of vengeful capitalism. But that doesn't necessarily need to mean that any individual is out for a certain kind of economic revenge, although that's an interesting thing to speak about um, and certainly does happen. 
And more recently than this book was published, I have written about um, sort of these new strange uh, investment fads like the GameStop phenomenon or NFTs as a kind of revenge capitalism where people are trying to get back at an economic system through its very self-same logics in a strange way. The sixth is that the revenge politics to which revenge systems and revenge capitalism gives rise often mis take mistaken targets, in part because these systems mask their own just vengeance as economic necessity, peaceful justice, or, oh, can't even see what I wrote there, uh, or human nature. So often the incredible crimes and cruelties of capitalism hide themselves as economic necessity or suggest that they're simply the outcomes of human nature, that the reason that some people are starving or some people are dying of opioid overdoses or some areas are being flooded or poisoned by industrial uh, effluent is simply, you know, a normal and natural part of the system. And in that context, it certainly gives rise to vindictive and vengeful affects and vengeful politics. But unfortunately, very often, those forms of revenge are misdirected. And the long history of capitalism, especially in the United States, but arguably around the world, has been the misdirection of vengeance against people who usually least deserve it, usually the people who are most easily oppressed or most easily exploited. So the United States has a long history, for instance, of essentially uh, whipping up proletarian rage at white proletarian rage at the conditions of capitalist exploitation and its outcomes and then using that to organize lynch mobs or to organize uh, parties to go and kill indigenous people. There's this kind of way in which revenge becomes a kind of resource that can then be leveraged in various ways for political purposes when its actual sources are mystified. For this reason, it's important that the history and present of revenge capitalism not be disentangled from other vengeful systems, including patriarchal gender terrorism, colonial genocidal brutality, and slavery. And in the book, I go through in some detail about thinking through the witch trials, as Sylvia Federici has written of them, as a kind of orchestrated politics of revenge. The capitalism is not alone in its in its whipping up of these vengeful affects or operating vengefully as a system of domination. The eighth thesis is that the easy condemnation of revenge is usually the narcissism of the privileged. Revenge is not a dark cloud on the horizon. It's already upon us. Condemning it is futile. The task is to foment an avenging imaginary for revolutionary transformation. And here I'm thinking about the ways in which Often when I was writing this book or since its publication, people have told me I shouldn't be thinking about revenge and I shouldn't be thinking about the politics of revenge. And my response is that, in fact, we live in an age of revenge politics to the extent that neoliberal capitalism has seemed to foreclose any positive future. We, both on the left and on the right, um, increasingly turn towards a politics of revenge that seeks to vivify revenge fantasies rather than actually try and build something different. And I think it's a very dangerous, uh, but also very potent uh, cocktail of contradictions that organizers need to be aware of. And simply condemning revenge and the politics of revenge, I think is actually very dangerous because it refuses to reckon with the feelings that a huge number of people, the vast majority I would suggest have. And if we fail to, un uh, to uh, understand and mobilize this kind of vengefulness, uh, it will go very easily to the right, as you probably have already seen. The authors and beneficiaries of revenge capitalism have names and they have addresses, but they're also, of course, completely replaceable. Revenge capitalism's success rests on its ability to conscript all of us to its reproduction one way or the other. So here again, I'm interested in moving away from the idea of an older form of sort of blanquism a kind of an older revolutionary revenge politics that included political assassinations, mind you. Um, because the type of capitalism we have now is one in which almost, as I was mentioning at the beginning of this talk, almost everyone who holds a position of power could be replaced really in a heartbeat. Um, and so a kind of simplistic approach to revenge, I think, will not be successful, let alone ethical. Um, 
So where does that leave us? Well, before I finish on where it leaves us, a tenth point, one of the things that I think is often um, mistaken is that we tend to condemn revenge fantasies as somehow beneath the serious politics. But I want to ask us to question that again. Um, because sometimes a revenge fantasy is all you have. If you've been deprived of any means to realistically imagine a different world where justice prevails uh, for you and yours, then having a revenge fantasy where you pay back the person or people who hurt you in the same coin in which that pain was issued, that becomes a resource for your own sense of self-worth and your own sense of collective empowerment. But on the other side of revenge fantasy, which can sometimes be an important starting place for radical politics, is something that I call an avenging imaginary. And here I'm drawing on uh, abolitionist thinking to think through what it would mean not only to demand that all of these horrible capitalist actors who've done terrible things should go to jail and receive the worst possible treatment in jail for their terrible crimes. Rather, it's to ask the question, how could we abolish the form of power that led them to be able to commit those heinous acts in the first place? How could we take a revenge not on those individuals, and let's set aside what sort of justice they should face for a moment, but not take the revenge on those individuals, but to think about how we could avenge ourselves upon a system such that the system is abolished and the forms of power and domination and oppression that the system created that have so harmed us are also abolished and are never usable for anyone. And so this leads to the final thesis. Uh, the task before us is to avenge the future of peace, care, abundance, connection, and thriving that we all are owed, but that, of course, revenge capitalism denies us, as well as to avenge all those who have died and continue to die fast or slow to reproduce the system of revenge capitalism. And the book concludes with a meditation, of course, on uh, Walter Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of history, where he writes that, you know, there's a debt that's owed of, by the present to past generations who struggled and fell before us. And that debt can't be settled cheaply. And that debt is to avenge them. It is to avenge them in a way that makes their vanquished dreams come true. And that, for me, I think, is an interesting place to both begin and end a meditation on a Marxist politics of revenge uh, and what that might mean for the struggles to come. And I'm sorry for going a little over time, but I would love to talk with you about this and maybe connect it to some current events that we're all grappling with today. Thank you, Max. That was really a great slideshow. And <laughs> was, did you do all that art? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. No, that was the, much of the art was what we commissioned for the comic on, um, on the opioids crisis. It was really something. Um, thank you very much. I, in a way, would like us to start talking because I don't think your presentation was just right in time because how can you explain those 11 things any faster? But uh, uh, just write stack or raise your hand uh, if you want to make a statement or ask a question. Uh, Kate, you're up, Kate. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, so I had a quick question that, I mean, it's kind of a discussion that started in the chat. Like I asked, towards the end, you talked about avenge, like imaginary, avenging imaginary, and how that's not about like holding individuals accountable, but trying to change the system. But then I was thinking like, you know, the system is made up of people and kind of their inclinations. And if people cannot be abolished, because we can't abolish people, then where do we go? And then, you know, there's some discussion that Systems are not just people, they're also like informal norms and traditions and mindsets. But if for me, it's just like, 
you know, like you can't get rid of an informal norm, you know, like you can, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I mean, I would say we, we don't only need to hold people to account. We also need to abolish systems. But I think people do need to be held to account. Um, you know, I think, though, that it begs the question of, like, what would a prefigurative form of justice look like? Uh, by which I mean, like, the justice systems that have been forged over the last 400 years of colonial racial capitalism clearly don't work. Um, and the forms of punishment that they, um, they allow are basically forms of collective revenge, um, but they're certainly not there to help us build a better society. So my question is like, yes, um, we should name names and hold people who've done terrible things. And, and, you know, even if they don't think that they're terrible things when they've done them to account, you know, I think we should be holding the CEOs of, um, of fossil fuel corporations to account. Um, I think the first thing though, is to make sure that we strip them of their power, because if we don't strip them of their power, then they'll never be held to account to begin with. And then after or as we strip them of their power, then I think there's another unfolding sort of revolutionary question about like, well, what, what, will, what form will that take of holding? And what, what do we want to do with a system of justice in a kind of revolutionary way that would be different and would have different kinds of outcomes than the system of kind of pathological injustice that we have today? Thank you. Uh, we have now, uh, there's a whole sequence. Chris Knight, then Brett, then Don, then Andres, and then Kate again. So uh, go ahead, Chris. Hi, I'm thinking of this um, issue of revenge capital, which is new to me and fascinating, but I see it in a, in a larger frame of indebtedness that where uh, indebtedness itself is used to control and used as a manner of power. Lazzarato wrote a book called The Making of Indebted Man. I think Agamben also wrote about indebtedness. Uh, but we can go as far back as Nietzsche and Nietzsche's interest in indebtedness as a means of control and power, and Nietzsche points the finger at St. Paul, and ultimately at religion, which um, levies uh, an indebtedness that can never be repaid. We are born with original sin. We owe, how can we repay a crucified God? So that we come to an indebtedness or a power structure that is unredeemable, unpayable. And I think that that leaves the power structure in a pretty good situ in its pretty good situation because they have all of history, religion, recorded history and religion in their, in their place. And I wonder if you had read any of these books and how they informed you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, I've been, I've been interested in debt and, and an activist around debt uh, for, for many years. And so, yeah, I was very influenced by that. And, and also, of course, by David Graeber's wonderful book on debt as well. Miranda Joseph has a really nice book on debt that was quite influential for me as well, where she talks about it also from the perspective of race and gender. And then there's a very good book, too, called uh, Carceral Capitalism by um, yeah. Jackie Wang on um, how debt, debt is entangled with the prison system. A really, really fascinating book. But yes, I, I, I went back to those authors as well. Lazzarato has been a big influence and, uh, and threw him back to Nietzsche. And yeah, I mean, in that chapter on unpayable debts, I, I, uh, I generally concur with what you're saying. I think that essentially for a very long time, and this is Graeber's argument, I think, too, in many different societies, not only the sort of Abrahamic societies that have that, um, 
that kind of notion of the fall from grace and uh, and then later the the sacrifice of Jesus. But in many other societies as well, you find this phenomenon where the powerful declare that the oppressed have a debt to them that can never be repaid. And that debt becomes the moral reason why the material or political economic phenomenon of oppression gets to just continue and continue and continue. Um, and I think that this is very deeply connected to topics of revenge. Um, I mean, first of all, as Margaret Atwood has pointed out in her book on debt, which I don't like mostly, but she's very smart and there's many interesting things about it. Um, she points out that, uh, you know, debt and revenge are very deeply connected, that, you know, you take revenge on someone or something because you feel they owe you a debt that they're not going to pay. Uh, we talk about people uh, owing a debt to society when we take revenge on them by throwing them in a dungeon or a prison. Um, there's this sense of a kind of temporal suspension in both debt and revenge where we're waiting for something. There's a kind of hiatus or a kind of pause where before the debt is paid or before the revenge is completed and the world kind of stops. Um, so that would be the first thing I would sort of mention. I think the two concepts are very, very closely related. And I think it's, it's useful to think about the way that young people are being treated by student loans or the way that Haiti has been treated since it gained its independence through a slave revolution by being encumbered by these unpayable debts as a kind of revenge that's being taken on them. But a revenge that doesn't necessarily even have a meaning or a need for a, a first infraction. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is like, you know, Nietzsche uh, also writes quite a bit about revenge, as you might imagine. And that thinking was quite influential for me too, because in Nietzsche's view, you know, revenge, he almost believes that revenge doesn't exist because if you're powerful enough to actually take revenge, it's not revenge. It's just the exercise of power. The thing we call revenge and George Orwell focused on this later after the second world war in ways I'll get to in a minute. If you're powerless, you dream of revenge and you and, and Nietzsche's warning is that the powerless often satisfy themselves with maintaining their position of powerlessness and just nursing an endless revenge fantasy. Um, and Orwell makes a similar points. It's a very interesting, very eerie passage he writes after the Second World War about how revenge is something that you dream about when you're powerless. Because ultimately, if you have enough power to take revenge, it's no longer revenge. It's justice, right? It's you taking justice for something that you... That, and, and the person who has the power to take that kind of revenge then institutes a new order of justice which I think both has very far right ramifications and, and some perhaps left-wing ramifications as well. But I'll, I'll maybe stop there because it gets a little janky. <laughs> so Brett, you are next. Yes, thank you. I first discovered your writings with the Money Lab. I, I associated you with, with Money Lab a few years ago. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm so interested in your matching the debt and money so much in this book. I'm reading Christine Desson's book called Making Money. I don't know if you've I haven't read it. found her. Um, but Christine Desson is a law scholar at Harvard Law School. Mm. She's bringing convening scholars to kind of take a cons almost a social constructionist view of, you know, the money system as something that was created. And mm. she's really making the point that what we know is capitalism emerges with the, emer the, the sort of formalization of banking in, in mm. England in the 17th century. And so what I guess what I'm getting at is your, your, your comment about how can we change the systems that are generating this power mm. and what, what is the role of the money in banking in your, mm. in your mind? I mean, it seems like it's a very tangible system to focus on and target with activism and with pro propositions for change. I mean, she describes how the activists in England were writing proposals to the kings, you know, to get to this form of the money, the bank, the Bank of England, and this sort of privatized issuance of the money system, which became now globally practiced and uncriticized. Mm. Um, so anyway, that's just my 
question is where do you see this system you know as a norm that isn't so abstract really it, it mm -hmm. is really pretty tangible and could be defined and reframed and brought to the imagination of activists in a much more clear way because it is the system that enables a few to re re reshape the world every few decades they can apply credit creation massively like they are now to artificial intelligence um, you know, and the, all the capital, but it starts with bank loans, creation of bank, creation of money as loans in the hands of a few people who can direct that money. I mean, I, I, I think, of course, you're right that, like, I think the fractional reserve banking system and the ways in which most modern nation states are entangled with private banks and the money issuance conundrum and the ways that that leads to various forms of manipulation are major problems. I'm very skeptical though of solutions that begin with what I term like a chiropractic maneuver on the, um, on the financial fiscal or monetary system, by which I mean like the idea that if we could kind of just press in the right place, uh, the whole kind of spine of capital would, would realign and we'd have kind of a better system of capitalism. I mean, I'm not against financial activism, although I have to say that most of the financial activists I've hung around with in the last 10 years have mostly given up um, because they found that the system of power is very well entrenched and it's, there, there's, there's a number of layers to actually influencing anything. So on the first layer, you have just the layer of like understanding the Byzantine structure of the financial system. On the next layer, you have influencing power holders and then behind that you have that there's actually real people with real power at some point who either don't want things to change or they do want things to change in a certain way so i feel like i'm i'm, I'm willing to be convinced that there might be forms of financial activism what i would want to see from them is that they actively actually make the conditions of proletarian and oppressed people struggle objectively better within a span of say three months. Uh, I'm less interested in the ideas that, you know, if we could just correct the economy, then it would sort of like, it would kind of hum along properly and all else being equal as the economists like to say, things would be better in the future. That's the first thing I would sort of say about it. The second thing is I'm still a kind of, I'm, I'm a very reconstructed Marxist on many levels, but I still actually think there's a huge amount of value when thinking about economics to always bring it back to the labor theory of value. Like I'm generally interested that there's all of this like funny, weird stuff happening in the financial realm around how we make money, how we talk about money. But at what point does that then speak to how goods, services and human labor, as well as our engagements with the more than human world are being orchestrated on or near the surface of planet Earth? Um, which isn't to say that the financial issues aren't important. And this is the third and final thing I would say about it is that I think Ultimately, any form of money, when it functions as money in a, in, a, in a complex economy, is a method by which we come into a relationship with the sublime that we are co-creating. So we're all part of this thing we call an economy. We all produce value and labor. We all generate wealth in our society. But that process is so in, in, infinitely complex that it's impossible for us to grasp in the imagination. And so in a certain way, I like to think about money and monetary systems as ways that we come to tell ourselves a story about our own productive and creative capacities. So I'm interested in telling different stories and I'm interested in telling different stories so that we can organize ourselves differently. Um, but my curiosity these days is increasingly towards what would it mean to try and tell a story about our creative um, productive capacity as a global species without money? What would it mean to tell that story through other mechanisms that w didn't always reduce themselves to kind of quantification? Or if they reduce themselves to quantification, what would it mean to, you know, and here I'm gonna go out on a limb and just say like, for the sake of argument, throwing away the idea of money and moving towards some sort of weird hybrid computerized and narco planned economy where worker cooperatives produce a bunch of stuff and we deal with supply and demand issues through 
advanced algorithmic technology rather than through the advanced algorithmic technology we call money. That's what fascinates me right now. I'm not proposing that. I'm not saying I have some sort of like, you know, robot sitting beside me that could actually undertake that. But we're now reaching the strange threshold of computing power uh, and global integration where you could consider organizing an economy without either a kind of dogmatic doctrinaire centralized planning or some sort of abstract money system. And that interests me because I think it asks us then to ask different questions about what an economy could be. Thanks. Um, oh, Don, you are the next person on stack. Go ahead. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Max. Uh, just a quick question I put in the chat earlier. Uh, when you were talking about revenge coming um, just through sh sheer negligence of capitalism, I, I, I guess I'm paraphrasing your, your words to call it negligent, uh, being negligent. But um, would you call paramilitaries when the governments look the other way, capitalist governments look the other way at paramilitary activities as uh, another form of revenge. And with that, I also have to leave in five minutes, go into a uh, Rittenhouse uh, verdict demonstration in Cleveland here. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, yes, I would. Um, I think these are the two kinds of revenge that I'm trying to think through at the same time. There's, there's the ways that capitalism has always, well, maybe that's actually three different forms. So the first form is that capitalism has always relied upon direct acts of vengeance against those whom it oppresses and exploits. So lynch mobs, the, um, you know, uh, the heinous sort of atrocities committed against colonized people, Pinkerton style vigilante violence, death squads and, and, uh, and paramilitaries in Latin America. These are all part of the furniture of a kind of capitalism that takes relentless revenge on anyone, not only anyone who opposes it, but anyone who might oppose it. And then the second kind of revenge I'm interested in is then this kind of revenge that begins to appear nebulously that kind of seems to escape like a, cl a toxic cloud from the system itself. And so here I'm thinking about those forms of neglect, those sort of murderous forms of neglect that exist all over the world and that simply leave people to die in this kind of horrific and capitalist necropolitics. Um, I'm especially in the book kind of concerned with this question of what Marx called surplus populations, but I prefer the term surplus because they're not actually surplus. They're made into surplus by capitalism. Um, and the way that certain populations are basically not needed they're dependent on capitalist markets for food, for shelter, for everything they need, but they're not needed by capitalism for labor power. And so essentially those people are left to die. But then the third category I'm interested in as well is the way that living under revenge capitalism in these systems also gives rise to these kind of vigilante or freelance forms of revenge, preemptive, preventive, reactionary revenge as well. Uh, and I think that's maybe what what we've seen uh, in the last few years is that, you know, especially in the case of these uh, far right terrorists, including Rittenhouse and many of these other sort of mass murderers, um, we see them essentially seeking out a kind of revenge for these strange affronts that they think have been committed against their country, against their religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here I want to point out um, that, you know, I think the, the, the thing that connects all of these, uh, these terrorists is um, almost always is, is gender. And I think we all also need to account for the fact that still like the, the largest, most persistent form of actually existing revenge is men killing women and trans and non-binary people in forms of revenge that are often undertaken when they get dumped or when they are affronted uh, and their masculinity is challenged. So I think that form of revenge, that kind of vigilante form of revenge um, is something that we really need to dwell with. And as Sylvia Federici has pointed out when it was a guest many times here uh, and re more recently Veronica Gago in Argentina has pointed out, this is deeply entangled with the structures of a kind of debt driven debt-driven capitalism that actually foment the conditions of more sort of femicide and, um, and attacks on trans and non-binary people as well. Uh, Andres, you are next. Hi, uh, 
Thank you very much. I was drawn to, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you from a parking lot in Anaheim, California. Wow. Um, I was drawn to the topic because um, the, the first um, example that I thought of, I, I happen to work with homeless people. I'm mm -hmm. a county worker and I put the Band-Aid on the cancer. <laughs> I, I, tempor I help temporarily house people. But what I see uh, is that homeless populations, homeless people, um, are the one of the current criminalized surplus populations, you know, and I, the the whole NIMBY phenomena, not in my backyard, the expulsions, the exclusions, the uh, the blaming um, of people who have fallen off off the grid, you know, by those who are the haves, the the haves who barely have. Uh, uh, attacking the have-nots. Uh, I see that on a daily basis. And it's, you know, you, you, you assault the people who you're able to see in your, in, your, in your eyesight, in your time. You can't really direct it at the people who are so high up on the pyramid. So you, you direct it at the, but, 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 but you also made me think of, uh, or this discussion made me think of, um, if you want to say imaginaries, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with the ghost dance of the, uh, Mm. I believe it was the 1890s under the leadership of Wawoka where Native people were having these dances that would evoke an, a physical overturning of my Earth Mother that it would ex throw the whites back into the ocean, you know, um, that it would undo, literally, literally uh, uh, cast out <laughs> white settlers. You know, and that was, of course, that was harshly repressed you also the discussion also put, took me back to my readings of Hannah Arendt Eichmann in Jerusalem if I recall correctly where Arendt concludes that Eichmann needs to die Eichmann needs to be executed because he would have us die and that I I, oh, I don't know I'm still grappling with that one yeah. you know because uh, I understand the argument completely and then the last thing I thought of is the famous uh, film Battle of Algiers. Mm -hmm. One of the opening scenes is Ali witnessing the guillotining of a comrade, of mm -hmm. a fellow revolutionary. You know, and and the rest of the film is av an avalanche of tortures and killings by the French colonial powers of the Algerian peoples. And NLF decides we were, we're going to pay in kind, mm -hmm. and they start uh, putting bombs on uh, discotheques on. Uh, gatherings where there are French citizens, you know, and just blowing them, blowing them up. So, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately I was raised under Christianity that that was imposed on us. So I'm Chicano, a Mexican American Chicano borderland guy. A lot of our uh, internalized oppression has to do with turning the other cheek mm -hmm. and you don't seek vengeance in kind. <laughs> but I think that what you, I think you might've uh, talked at this about this, at a later, earlier point that um, it's not so much a choice between Christian self-immolation or self-punishment or uh, imposing the same things on the oppressor that the oppressor would have put on us, but a transcendence of that model, you mm -hmm. know, of seeking something that uh, goes beyond what we're swimming in, what we're, we're caught up in. Um, I also thought of the Khmer Rouge and the Red Guard, you know, Khmer Rouge and and Puchea and the Red Guard in China, that the bloodletting that they did. I've, I've met Chinese exiles, Chinese immigrants who called that the, the decade that we went crazy, mm -hmm. you know, and it was this sort of unleashing, probably by the bureaucrats of, you know, of young, youthful energy against the old world. I, that's, that's what your, your discussion evoked, and I'm very grateful for it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right about. Uh, the way in which people end up, people with a, a modicum of power and privilege end up targeting people below them for revenge when they should actually be targeting people above them. And it's a terrible, uh, a terrible quality, I think, of, of human systems and especially capitalism where the people above are in almost invisible or they're celebrities. Um, I share a fascination with the ghost dance and with a series of activities that happened all around the world in those decades where uh, in the face of colonialism, many different uh, groups in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas um, prophesied that the dead would rise up with them to take revenge. 
Um, it was a very strange moment in global history. Uh, and I, I have in mind actually someday to try and write a book about it. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating episode. Um, uh, Nick Estes, uh, who wrote a really wonderful book on Standing Rock uh, and is a great indigenous theorist, um, has talked a little bit about um, uh, the ghost dance from a kind of Marxist perspective. That's really interesting. Um, Eichmann, the Eichmann trial is also, I think, really interesting. I mean, the, the lesson I took from the story of Hannah Arendt and the Eichmann trial is that she actually fell afoul of many of her fellow um, refugee and Holocaust survivors because she go, went to the trial and she was like, this isn't really a trial. This is revenge. Um, this is us take, we found a Nazi and now we're going to take revenge on him, but it doesn't actually, it's not justice. And, you know, she was a liberal theorist. So justice meant a lot to her and she lost a lot of friends because of that. Um, and I think that's why she ended up saying Eichmann has to die. Like Eichmann has to die, not because, uh, I mean, partly because of he was a monster, but also because we need to kill a monster. Um, and then, Maybe the, I, I, there's a fascinating um, quotation. Fanon doesn't, Fanon's always talking about revenge, but he doesn't, he doesn't speak about it specifically. But he has a wonderful line where he says, you know, like the desire for revenge among the Algerians is completely justified, but it's not enough. Um, which is a fascinating, you know, because he's like, well, yeah, you can have the desire for revenge. It's legitimate, but you need to have more than that to have the revolution to actually overturn the system that, created the desire for revenge in the first place. And that maybe leads to the last thing I would say just about the religion, which is that like, um, there's a wonderful quotation that is attributed to Confucius, uh, which I've kind of tried to reinterpret it in a strange Marxist way. Confucius apparently said, and there's some, there's some dispute among Confucius scholars that uh, when you set out on a journey for revenge, dig two graves. And the common interpretation is that you know, one grave is for your opponent, but the other grave is for you because you will be killed in the course of revenge. And the broader interpretation is usually that, like, when you set out on a quest for revenge, you dedicate your whole being to that revenge. And I think we've all known people, either directly or by extension, who have been become so obsessed with their quest for a kind of revenge that they lose all scope of their character. This is what the chapter in the book on uh, Moby Dick is about, about Ahab, who kind of just lives for revenge. Um, and my reinterpretation of that quotation is, it comes from like the, the Marx dialectic and particularly the way the Marx dialectic expresses itself in the um, uh, uh, negation of the negation. So in a way, there's something hopeful about it because you dig two graves, your opponent is going to be vanquished and with your opponent will also be buried in the second grave, the thing you became under the rule of your opponent. So the idea of the, um, the uh, negation of the negation is that the proletariat in their struggle to overthrow capitalism would not only uh, get rid of the capitalist class, they would get rid of all classes, including themselves. Now, all of the people would remain. I mean, maybe short a few capitalists. But essentially, there would be in the future that the proletariat was creating in that kind of more orthodox Marxist view, there would be a world where there was no such thing as the proletariat anymore because there would be no classes. And so the people who would wake up after the credits roll at the end of this great revenge film of the Marxist proletariat would wake up not knowing themselves, not knowing who they were, because they, what they had been had been forged in the crucible of their own oppression. And Fanon makes a very similar point, too, that, you know, once we overthrow and throw off the shackles of colonialism, we will no longer know who we are. Something, there will be a body in that grave. We will be looking down at our, our own body, essentially. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, Steve Knight, you are next. You may have to move closer to your mic, Steve. Um, Max, I'm I, I, I'm kind of interested in, in learning more about this avenging imaginary. You know, you write at one point here in the introduction, an avenging imaginary capable of inspiring and holding together the kind of revolutionary assemblage of the exploited. 
Um, just so I can maybe get a little clearer grasp of it, can, can you cite one or two examples from history of when you think an avenging imaginary has, has, has actually been brought to fruition? Yeah. I mean, I wish I, I wish I could. I think I would say that the avenging imaginary hasn't ever necessarily manifested itself in its full form in the material world, but it's always been a force within revolutionary movements, but only one force among many. Uh, I think there's still in many of those movements, the force of revenge fantasy as well, which, you know, attempts to take the power of the oppressor and use it against them. Um, but I think, you know, I took a lot of inspiration here from the work of uh, abolitionist thinkers in the United States, uh, you know, working in the spirit of Angela Davis or uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, Mariam Kaba and others who are thinking through what it would mean to try and build a movement that would not only seek to take power, but annihilate the kind of power that they're fighting against and invent new forms of power at the same time. And I think that's actually happened at many points in history in certain ways, um, but never fully and never in a pure sort of way. I mean, I think we could look to the, the kind of canon of revolutionary history to see that playing out, you know, when the, when the communists took over Paris at the close of the Franco-Prussian War, uh, they were inventing and trying to come to terms with new forms of popular justice, new forms of economic activity and economic planning, new forms of practically everything that were seeking not only to um, take the kind of bourgeois state and use it for proletarian purposes, but actually completely reinvent what it would mean to live and work together. Um, so sort of something that's been pointed out in Kristen Ross's uh, lovely book on the Paris Commune. Um, and in general, I think in many other movements, that's quite uh, prevalent. I mean, one of the movements that's been very inspiring to me while I was writing the book, I was living in the Canadian city of Thunder Bay, which is six hours north of Minneapolis, and is Canada's racism and hate crime capital, um, mostly directed against Indigenous people who represent about 20% of the population. I mean, the indigenous militants I was working with there are quite clear that they have no desire to simply take over settler colonial institutions and run them themselves. They want to abolish the settler colonial institutions of justice and of power and rebuild and reinvent more indigenous focused uh, alternatives. And I think that to me feels like uh, an avenging imaginary because these are folks who probably you know, their desire for revenge would be legitimate, to paraphrase Fanon, after everything they've suffered. Um, it would be totally legitimate for them to say, we're coming and we're taking all of the white people's houses and, you know, going to take their kids and put them into special indoctrination schools where they're going to be abused. And we're going to basically, uh, you know, starve them and make them live in abject poverty for several generations and then blame them for their own problems. Those would all be completely... Uh, understandable desires, but that's not what's at the core of the political vision. It's a vision of how could we collectively create a world where those terrible things that happened could never happen again to anyone. And those are the kinds of avenging imaginaries that I'm interested in, but I'm not necessarily convinced, like an avenging imaginary is not, is not a revolutionary program. It's, I would say it's more like a revolutionary spirit. It's something that animates uh, an approach rather than necessarily gives us a kind of, um, uh, blueprint for how to organize a future society. Thanks. I, I'm glad you brought up the Paris Commune because I was thinking, as you were doing your 11 points, Max, I was thinking of how when we think of the great French Revolution, there was a brief period of time when what was left of what was essentially a bourgeois revolution, but what was the left of that group did kill a fair number of people. Mm -hmm. But the retaliation, the revenge, the, the resurgent combo monarchist bourgeois did in, in less time, they killed and maimed way more people. That, yet that is never called a so-called reign of terror. And the life of the commune from the very beginning the, the people gathered at Versailles were taking captured communards and at lunch and dinner having entertainments of torturing and 
murdering captured communards. The, and, and in the commune, that the, they, had, they had captured the Archbishop of Paris, some others who were being held as hostages. They didn't torture them. They did kill a couple of them at the very end, but it was not something the, the commune even really wanted to do. They, there, there wasn't this bloodlust in, in the commune, yet the, the, the forces gathered at Versailles and the Prussians were, were killing every, they were torturing and killing and saying nothing of the, the terrible bloodletting. And I, I feel in some ways I want revenge every day and, and the, the 11 points of revenge are there. Yet from our position, except for like Andres pointed out, uh, Pol Pot and whatever happened in culture, there have been moments of retaliation that I don't even know how much people were into doing it. People wanted to get on with redistributing arranging production in an equitable basis. It was uh, what I found in our event yesterday. We had a, a class where this guy has done a lot of research on <clears throat> the colonial settler society as it was set up in Rhode Island. Hmm. And he made mention that Roger Williams was astonished that the society there could reproduce itself on people working four to five hours a week, and that the Europeans could not believe there could be such a system of sharing in society where you would only have to work four or five hours a week. When you made the point about our current computing power that we often lose sight, we as workers have built that computing power, there, there would certainly be an algorithmical way to have tremendous types of, of sharing and derive a non-exploitative future in, in, in multiple ways that we can't even think of now, I think. And until we're on that road, we don't even know how fair we would be to one another. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm just bringing this up from the trajectory of the, the, not just the systemic aspect of the daily extraction from what there are seven and a half billion of us, uh, the excess labors of seven billion of us are being extracted on a daily basis, which is something to get revenge for right away of, of, of everything else. We, we, but uh, the, the, in any case, the, the, the attempts we have, we have made to overthrow when capital wins, their retaliation is so much more than what we, we've ever done in, in our taking of power. But uh, yeah. yeah. A, po a point that's made very well, I think, also by C.L.R. James uh, in his uh, Black Jacobins, where he talks about, you know, he this amazing phrase where he says, you know, when history is finally written as it truly happened, uh, historians will marvel at uh, not the cruelty and ferocity of the revolutionary proletariat, but their uh, endless forbearance and, uh, and uh, generosity. I mean, I, I agree generally, I think, that you know, there's there's a difference, and Marx made this uh, distinction himself. What he wrote about revenge only a few times, but he said some very interesting things about it. And one of them was he said, you know, like he was writing about the um, the repression that followed the Sepoy Rebellion, what the British called the the Sepoy Rebellion in India in uh, I think it was 1857, um, when basically that soldiers, uh, Indian soldiers, both Hindu and Muslim, who were working for the East India Company, rebelled. Um, and, and them and, and commoners uh, and various others led this kind of massive rebellion across the subcontinent against the, um, the East India Company. What's that? Was that? Oh. Um, made noise, that's all. I don't know uh, what. Um, in, the, in the wake of that, Marx, I'm not going to get the, the quotation right, but he said, you know, like, yes, of course, in that revolution, the revolutionaries took horrible revenge against the uh, colonial or the, the East India Company officials and, you know, also innocent people, the wives and children and uh, European servants of, of officials. And that was terrible. And it was whipped into this huge frenzy in the British press, uh, you know, as like this horrible affront to British honor and just a display of how barbaric the, the Indians were. 
But Mark says, you know, the difference is that uh, that these were episodic uh, moments of vengeance and massacre, whereas revenge and massacre were the policy of the East India Company. You know, like this had been hundreds of years of routinized, uh, you know, horrific violence enacted in the name of the accumulation of wealth. Um, but of course, what gets remembered are these particular orgies of violence that occur. And, and James makes a similar case about, um, about the Haitian Revolution, which, you know, we shouldn't, it was very violent <laughs> um, and involved horrible atrocities. And we shouldn't excuse those atrocities. But James always wants us to remember that, that the atrocities were learned at, um, at, the, at the hands of the oppressor. In fact, Marx has a quotation. I'll see if I can remember it exactly. It says that there is something like a human law of human retribution, but it, the law is that the re retribution of the oppressed will always be paid back in the coin in which it had been sort of issued, um, and that we need to look to essentially who, what the school was in which that revenge was learned. Um, and certainly that, I think, bears out in the history of slave rebellions as well, where you know, um, people who for generations had been known basically only torture uh, when they had a chance often undertook torture themselves, but they didn't impose a system of torture for generations. <laughs> and I think generally when, when the oppressed have had a chance to set up new systems after those moments that often do result in terror and atrocity, um, they are seeking to set up systems where those kind of policies of torture and atrocity are no longer possible. Whether they succeed or not is another question all the time, but uh, yeah. Chris, do you have your hand up again? Chris or Steve, do you have your hands up again? You just didn't take, okay. Andres, you do. Go ahead, Andres. Oh, I, I kind of did. Uh, someone, I forget if it was Max or someone else uh, was talking about um, a system in which we could maybe uh, use the technology, the algorithms now to have like the read. I al it always harks back to Edward Bellamy's looking backward. And there's, I, if I remember correctly, there's a, there's a, a moment where they go to a, like a huge warehouse sort of situation and people have maybe pre-ordered the items that they want. This is way before <laughs> any of these uh, new technologies would be available to humans, but it sort of maybe prefigures um, a non-exploitative, hopefully sustainable uh, way of supplying for people's needs and also their wants. Uh, and I, that, that always uh, comes back to me in these discussions. I also wanted to say that the, the, I'm fascinated with the, uh, the Spanish Revolution of the 1930s, 1936-37, and what they were able to do in Catalonia, Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't think that they were hell-bent on exacting revenge from, the Frank, from Franco's forces or the capitalists. They were just really interested in setting up for the time that they were able to um, work places and distribution centers that, coinc that, that matched up with their vision of an egalitarian society. It, I think that we can draw a lot of inspiration from, it was, of course it was, it was destroyed. It was cut down, but it was in a moment. It was a moment. I mean, it, it harkens back to the communards and here it is a 20th century example of that in Spain. And that, that's what I, I thought of in this discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, in the, you know, Max, I want to go to your slideshow and peel back and figure out where to go. But it, it, it feels, you know, we're, we're on the same type of plane of, of reference, so I feel like, oh, I can go back to that PowerPoint and see what's yeah. there. But um, have you looked at Leslie Marmon Silko's um, Almanac of the Dead? And I have the book and I've not read it yet. I've been looking forward to it for years when it's been on myself. Well, 
you know, it, on the if your book jacket is the same as mine. Larry McMurtry does say of it that is it is the Das Kapital of the American Southwest, mm -hmm. and it very much is, and it, it deals with a lot of these questions. And mm -hmm. I I just bring it up as something that if you have a month to take to go through the book, it's very very dense and takes time to go through it would be a great compliment to revenge capitalism really and, okay. and i'll and, move it to the top of the list yeah and and it very much addresses what you were saying the the uh, first you know in canada i don't know if it's a state terminology to say first peoples in the u.s there is we in our understanding of ourselves as a colonial settler society is way behind where Canadian progressives have put the national dialogue in Canada. We, we, um, we, uh, we don't really, in America, many people think it's good enough. Some people have casinos and they're making money. Isn't that enough for those and they will say those people as <laughs> so they, the, not all those peoples were were uh, essentially massacred in numbers we have real really no idea of. But it is an amazing book that speaks to what has ha happened, but also what could really take place. And, and, and I highly recommend it to everyone here. Uh, so. Um, Bro, uh, Victor, did you have something you wanted to say? I, I'm having a hard time. How do you see Victor as some of what you discussed seems more like punishment than revenge? How do you see these concepts relating? Ah, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, let me answer it in two parts. I think for those who undertake revenge, they probably always think of it as punishment, as just a normal punishment. And, uh, you know, so like when the, when the colonial officials, you know, um, kill a bunch of people because they, the, the colonized people are not working fast enough, they would certainly call it punishment. But in fact, I think it, it's revenge. Um, and similarly, maybe conversely, like, I think the well, maybe I'll just back up and say, I think the concepts are very closely related. And this maybe comes to the second point. Um, part of the argument of the book is that the way we think about, so let me back up, sorry, one step before that. Revenge is obviously something that humans have grappled with since we've probably been humans. Uh, certainly revenge is present in the earliest cultural texts that we have on record. Um, it is not um, foreign to any culture. Um, that said, different cultures and different societies address revenge in different ways and have many different words for revenge. So there's some languages in which there's very particular gradations for talking about revenge in different ways. There's legitimate revenge, and illegitimate revenge. There's revenge that is undertaken for cosmological reasons and re revenge that's undertaken for sort of um, worldly reasons. We in English have, and most Romance languages, uh, have just one word for revenge. Although I've tried to separate out this word revenge from avenge, which go the, the, the distinction goes back to the 16th century. It's, it's not a new distinction. But in any case, what this all leads me to think is that, in fact, to a certain extent, though this thing that we are trying to understand when we use the word revenge is real, the words that we use to describe it are social constructions. They're artificial. And here I'm making a fairly sort of structuralist, post-structuralist argument about the nature of language, but more sort of a Foucauldian argument about how discourse gets constructed. Because my argument is that ultimately the way that we imagine revenge has already been shaped by capitalism, by, by sort of European colonial modernity, by the sort of legacies of the Enlightenment for both good and for ill. And so we come to imagine this thing we call revenge in a very specific frame. Um, and that frame is that revenge can only be undertaken by individuals or groups, not by systems. 
and that revenge is somehow what uh, Francis Bacon, the uh, Elizabethan courtier and, uh, and scientist and, and, and philosopher said is a wild justice a justice that is illegitimate because it takes place outside of the remit of the law given by the king or the sovereign. Um, so my argument in the book is that, in fact, if, if revenge is a discursive formation, if the very way that we understand what revenge is is something that has been constructed by the architecture of power, by the architecture of schooling, by the architecture of ideology, then it becomes a political act to reinterpret what revenge might mean. And so for that reason, I, I'm sort of playing with the concept. And for that reason, it does blur over into other categories. I mean, you could, re, you could look at this book, it would be an interesting experiment that I'm never going to do, but you could look at this book and you could say like, okay, what if we replace the word revenge with punishment? What if we replace the word revenge with violence? What if we just replace the word revenge with, uh, with you know, exploitation? And in a certain way, certain things about the book would work quite well, but other things wouldn't work quite well. Um, and so, yeah, I guess my argument is that on some level, we need, we have a, we have a right and an obligation and we are allowed to kind of bend the meaning of the word a little bit because it's already sort of bent or forged in a certain kind of way. I mean, maybe one one thing to add is just that like from the perspective of the powerful their revenge always appears or is made to appear as punishment or often as self-defense as we learned in the verdict of the trial the other day that you know like this was a this was a, a kid who had been so indoctrinated by far-right bullshit that he essentially armed himself to go take revenge on people for what he perceived to be destroying the fabric of America. Um, but in the, in the mindset of the powerful, that, that revenge is relabeled as self-defense. In the same way that, you know, like when the slave owner kills an enslaved person, they don't say, oh yeah, I did it for revenge. They say, I did it for self-defense. Or when the British invade the country and, and you know, dominate it, they don't say, oh, we did it because we wanted their resources and we wanted revenge. They say it was for their own good or for the purpose of civilization or blah, 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 blah. There's always these kind of justifications that hide this fundamental uh, systemic and structural vengeance. So, uh, you know, this is something I, I am bringing up. We're, we're public and it'll be on tape and all that, but... We have people in some of our classes that are part of uh, Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And the discussion of what some of what XR does comes up as being close to vigilantism or it is not pointing people to take action against those that are destroying the climate, but actually by gluing doors shut on public transit and that kind of thing, there is a further victimization of us and yet I think that the coverage, I've not been to an XR action like that, so I don't know if I, I'm seeing the results of reportage that are not accurate or not. However, the, the tipping points are getting to be so everywhere. And, and to so many of us, the question of whether we have two, maybe three generations more of being able to survive on the planet can certainly fuel things like ex, uh, Extinction Rebellion going to the Metro in Paris, London, or New York and making sure that people can't get to work that day to fuel uh, investment in fossil fuels any longer. These kinds of, of, uh, of uh, rationales do develop. So um, I, I wonder what, I mean, I'm bringing this up. Uh, there are people in our community around the MEP that are XR people who would um, have no question that what the, the, those actions are, are the right thing to do. Do you have any take on those types of actions that are being taken at this point? I mean, if I'm honest, I think they're very tame uh, given, given what's happening. Um, I mean, there was an interesting article in Roar magazine recently about what the author called climate blankeyism, 
And I was been trying to work on something on climate revenge for a couple of months. And I think they put it better than I could though, using a slightly different language. Like um, I, I'm actually just shocked that there isn't actual like climate revenge terrorism. And like Fanon, I like it's, it's uh, I think it's actually like, there's an argument that it would be justified it's not enough. It's not actually going to change things necessarily on its own, but I'm a little surprised. And I, I'm a little surprised too, that the discussion around climate justice has gravitated so much to topics like climate grief. And I just don't know why people aren't talking about climate revenge. I mean, it, it's literally like a very small number of people are making choices that are, that are basically going to consign billions of people to death and misery. Um, I mean, can you take revenge on behalf of a stolen future? I don't know. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm, I, so I, I think what I'm suggesting here is maybe there's a, there's a political question, there's a moral question, and there's a strategic question, and it might be used disentangling them. From a political perspective, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more vociferous actions. I'm surprised there haven't been assassinations of, you know, uh, and I think that might not be far off in our future. From a political perspective, as someone who analyzes politics, I can understand why people would undertake those kinds of actions. And I can also fathom why they would see those as legitimate. And certain aspects of the argument for why they would be legitimate, I would agree with. From a moral perspective, it's abhorrent, obviously. Uh, you know, that kind of terrorism and that kind of assassination is something that is morally wrong for humans to do to each other. And I've made the argument that in fact, many of the people who are undertaking the actions that are destroying the earth just think or feel like they're part of a machine and they can't do anything else or that if they didn't do it, somebody else would do it or somebody else would do something worse. So from a moral perspective, I'm completely against it and I'm not going to advocate it and I'm not going to do it. Then there's a question from a strategic perspective, which is like, if we acknowledge that we have very little time to create some form of political change that would stop the catastrophic effects of climate change, what should the role of political violence in that be? And Andreas Malm, who's just published a book called How to Blow Up a Pipeline, has a very specific answer. Earth First had a very specific answer uh, in, um, in his recent novel, Ministry of the Future, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson presents a couple of kind of scenarios about what that kind of like climate terrorism might look like. Um, for me, the most important question is the strategic question at this point, because we could argue till we're blue in the face about morality, and we could argue till we're blue in the face about the politics of it. But ultimately, the question is what is going to change the uh, situation realistically and what are we willing to sacrifice to make that happen uh, and I think the problem is that if we don't talk about it kind of openly and we sort of shuffle it to the side then we're not asking those strategic questions and those strategic act those strategic questions get asked in you know what the old anarchists used to call the propaganda of the deed so essentially someone is going to undertake that action at some point and we're all going to have to deal with the aftermath in the climate justice movements. Um, so I think it's better actually to talk about it beforehand and say like, well, okay, uh, is, is, the, is not just is this a legitimate tactic, but is this a tactic that is strategic in terms of an actual struggle and making gains? My initial argument to that, if I were to join such a debate, would be to say probably not, but it's an interesting debate to have. Yeah. Thank you, Max. I, I thought that was a really clear response to that kind of thing. And here we are in, in 2021. I think the atmospheric river is a new term in our language. Before this year, we did not have the climate disruption from fossil fuels putting the amount of water in the atmosphere that literally is like a river. We were here in the New York area, we were we have been victims of this once already, and I've been through huge rainstorms, but an atmospheric river really does happen. It is when you go outside during these things, you are literally underwater. And, and we see this now as 
uh, you're 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 from Canada. Canada is about to have its second atmospheric river in a week in Vancouver, which is a year ago. This kind of description would seem like it was out of a Kim Stanley Robinson novel, so to speak, and that how can you take a river and put it up in the sky and drop it on people? But it's happening, and I. Uh, 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 it's, uh, the, the, that's where XR seems to be so much tame in their response. If you're going to do something, do it as big as what you're doing your thing against in, in a certain way. Andres, oh, you're saying thank you. Um, uh, Michael? Yes. If, could I just throw in a couple of... You can. Two, two, two more, two bits more? Yes. Um, yes, and then go ahead. I, I happen to live in a, a, a part of California, the southern part of California, which is very conservative, very, very reactionary. Uh, they voted, this county voted for the recall of the governor in this last, uh, this last vote. So I, I'm constantly being red baited. I'm constantly um, <laughs> uh, being called to task for having what I would call just liberal ideas. But one of the things that I'm, I always puzzle about is uh, in pa all seemingly all, all past revolutions, the, the triumph of the revolution did not mean that those who had lost power were replaced, were convinced by what the revolutionaries had argued for. In other words, they... The, they, they gave up or they were defeated, <laughs> but they were philosophically or intellectually, I don't know if I'm giving it too much, or ideologically still aligned with the old system and were, would remain looking for a way to get back into power. Uh, I guess because I've now actually... I often have, I lived in New York and I often thought that New, we New Yorkers lived in a bubble, although I think if you go out to Long Island or you go upstate, you, you meet this kind of reactionary thinking. Are we millenarians in the sense that we think <laughs> that a successful revolution will convince or bring along the vast majority to our way of thinking? Or is that, is that like a, a notion that has no basis? In, you know, in reality, uh, because you would have to have an overwhelming majority more or less ascribing to the same plan in order for this to not continue to be an ongoing ping pong game. Uh, I, that, that was just my last thought. And I, I do have to leave in a little while. I'm in about five minutes. So I'm going to take off. But thank you for this excellent discussion. Well, uh we only have a few more minutes, Andre, and, and Andres, and uh, um, I don't want. So, does anyone else have a question or comment while Max is here? Uh, Stephen. Stephen, go ahead, and, and yeah, this will um, be our last one because it's five hours or six hours later for you, Max. Right? It's like middle I, of the yeah. Yes. I'm. So go I'm ahead, Stephen. I'm a Herman Melville fan, maybe like you said, oh, I'm a minority, but you said you might, it right at the end, you might find a few minutes just to talk a little bit about Moby Dick and how it fits into the book. I'd be interested just to hear a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, what an amazing book. So sorry for anyone who is not a Moby Dick fan. Uh, I understand all of the reasons why everyone would hate it, but uh, it's fascinating. I mean, it's a fascinating, I mean, C.L.R. James's interpretation of it is just so wonderful because he points out that this is really a story about management and Ahab is a manager, you know, um, and his ship is the factory. And, uh, and what I love about it and, and taking off from James, it's like, what, is, what does it mean? You know, if, if Ahab is not just a factory owner, but like the quintessential factory owner, what does it mean when rather than presenting the factory owner, the capitalist is this hyper rationalist actor as in Adam Smith, or even in Marx himself, where, you know, he kind of accepts that the capitalist, all else being equal is motivated by profit. And therefore you have the falling rate of profit and all of the kind of accoutrements of, of a Marxist theory of capitalism. 
But what if instead of thinking about, you know, the capitalist as this sort of suave, intelligent investor, uh, it's it's Ahab, this monomaniacal, ecocidal maniac who lives for nothing but revenge. Um, and that in some way we're all trapped on the Pequot, the, the, the whaling ship. Um, we're the crew. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting in that book because Ahab has to always measure as the captain how he's going to pursue his kind of monomaniacal revenge dream against this whale and also how he's going to manage this polyglot, um, many-headed hydra of a crew that he has on his, on his ship, which are from all over the world. They have completely different philosophical and religious beliefs. They don't all get along. Um, and he has to do both at once. Um, and I, so I think there's something really fascinating about that. And then also just that, you know, what that in that, in that chapter, I also take up the concept of nature's revenge, which is a very popular trope these days, I guess, for a whole variety of reasons, which I, I sort of argue in the book. Um, but ultimately in a weird way, like, if we take Moby Dick to not be a metaphor and to be an actual whale, then Moby Dick had every reason to try and destroy the Pequot and its crew and the whole whaling fleet. I mean, the sperm whale uh, population in the 19th century declined by over 95%. Um, it was an absolute massacre. And of course, sperm whales are probably smarter than we are. I mean, their brains are certainly bigger. They seem to have incredibly sophisticated methods of communicating across half the world's circumference. They're an amazing species. So it's not difficult to imagine that they would be able to meditate on and plan revenge as Moby Dick does. But my argument in that chapter is that ultimately we often project vengefulness onto this thing we call nature or onto non-human animals as a way to somehow um, not actually take action. So in our own day and age, we're constantly watching these movies or reading these books about like, you know, catastrophic climate change or, you know, there's a whole genre called animal horror uh, or, you know, even Godzilla going back for a while, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where nature rises up and takes revenge on humanity. But ultimately this is a revenge fantasy against ourselves. There's something of a kind of um, collective uh, sort of political death drive here where we constantly replay this fantasy of our own annihilation in order to convince ourselves of our inability to stop that and our culpability. There's something very kind of dark and weird about it. And I see that, that uh, Melville is playing with that in Moby Dick, even, you know, because M Melville was himself a whaling sailor and part of that ecocidal process and clearly very ambivalent about it. So he, even in the 19th century, gives us some resources to think through very, very 21st century problems. Thanks. We'll leave it at that, because otherwise the Melville haters are going to get angry at us. I don't think you had any Melville haters here today, Max. Oh, great. Perfect. Well, let's do this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, if you don't mind only a few people showing up, I know that we could get at least six to seven people for a Melville presentation. Um, and And... Uh, we would more than, I would definitely make room for that in our, our schedule. And, and, I, I should say, I mean, I would love to participate, but there are people who know Marxists who know a lot more about Melville than I do. Yes, yes. Cesare yes. Casarino wrote a great book, and uh, Robert Talley, both are really great Marxist thinkers on Melville, I know. So. That, that's good to know. So um, it is after uh, four o'clock, and I think that, you know, a number of us, just so everyone knows, a good number of people paid for today, yesterday and today, and didn't show. I can only assume they're at Rittenhouse demos, and that happened yesterday's event as well. Um, and if there are demos tomorrow, I encourage people to go out and, and uh, let your voice be heard. Max, that was, I'm, I'm, I really want to get this book in, in hand, I, I didn't, you know, I, you know, I do the thing on online where you can read the first pages or whatever, but your, your PowerPoint on it was really good and makes it seem like an incredible book to read. Um, and, and I appreciate your spending time. I sent you proposed dates. 
as email during this time to come back and address revenge on the, the what the opioid war that capital has unleashed on the working peoples the world over um and and we'll we'll get to that and you'll respond i thank everyone for coming and w what a great uh book to start the new year thinking about the new year with and i uh, max i encourage everyone here to go out and get their own copies and we'll we'll get one in the MEP online bookstore, which is lower price than Pluto. So we we encourage people to read, discuss, and read again and discuss again. So thank you, Max, and uh, uh, we'll see you back in North America one of these days, right? Yes, one of these days. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and goodbye, everyone, and thank you for coming today. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, everyone.